So grateful to be here this evening and wanted to start out by thanking the league. I uh, wanted to thank the jury. I uh, want to say a special thanks to Ann Rieselbach, uh, who was invaluable help throughout this process. Um, and of course, would like to thank everyone who uh, put so many hours into making the exhibition possible. Um, that would be Chris Beeling, Carrie Lin, Eugene Su, as well as Bing Zhao, uh, Wen Chin Li, and uh, Yi Zheng, uh, who helped with the fabrication. Um, as well as countless other people. And uh, special thanks to my family, uh, who are um, most of them all here tonight. And uh, my wife, who just flew in. And uh, um, special thanks to my father, David. So as Brian said, the, my work deals with geometry and how that's used to strategically address site. And one of the few things that architects have uh, to use uh, at, their, at their disposal is, is site. Uh, it's very different than uh, some type of um, product design uh, or uh, intellectual um, process where there's something real uh, that confronts the physiology of, of people and the experience, the corporeal experience of being in the world. Um, I see my work as uh, much as it's uh, strategic as, as tactical. It's work that deals with very uh, explicit problems in architecture for clients who um, are huge contributors to the design process, uh, a couple of whom are here this evening. And um, I see that negotiation with reality as a huge part of the process. So let's say the friction of the process is important to me. Um, I'd like to show you the exhibition that I've designed, uh, which is what I'll use as the lens to look at the work. And I'll just walk through the exhibition. Um, the exhibition is a series of, of drawings and renderings and physical models that are arrayed on the wall in such a way that they explicitly deal with the site, the site of the gallery. Uh, and how do you deal with a white box gallery? Uh, you're left with a, you know, this is the convention um, uh, for, you know, the last hundred years of how art and uh, design is displayed. And what do you do? What do you do with that? So my my piece is about a series of white boxes, and those boxes are are all uh, arrayed on the on the wall, and they're actually used as a way to frame the work. So the actual drawings and the work are the elements that are uh, that are negotiating between the gallery itself. Uh, so. One of the things that's really important to me as I'm working is to deal with how elements perform in multiple ways. So if I can use elements in the design to fulfill multiple objectives at the same time, I think most of us uh, as architects and designers would wish to do that. Uh, something that I ask my students to consider all the time is how to do that. So I'm thinking about how the, the images and the objects can not only uh, shape space, so there's a, uh, there's a con concave uh, shape to this based on the viewing angle at eye level so that the pieces are actually bending to the, to the eye. They're also justified slightly to the exterior to deal with daylight, to get more daylight on the surface and to register uh, the light in the space, both the natural and artificial, through the protrusion off the wall through shadows and reflections, and the reflections are both um, uh, creating a shimmering effect as the surface contorts, but also uh, allowing the viewer to place themselves in the work by seeing an image of themselves uh, overlaid uh, in the work itself. And that changes, of course, as the viewer moves around the piece. And in addition to that, this idea of movement or rippling 
uh, happens in different temporal scales. So the idea of the kind of shimmering across the surface uh, happens as it moves through the general uh, concave and then there are smaller uh, little uh, uh, canyons that are carved through the piece in a, in a different uh, scale of temporality. So let's say uh, the time of erosion um, or another type of movement. Again, negotiating between uh, solid and void. And the work is categorized in such a way that the projects flow from one to the next, but they're all grouped together. And uh, the models kind of move across in an upward diagonal, kind of grouping closer and closer as it transitions between project type And most of these are residential projects. Most of the work are, these are typical types of uh, buildings that one would encounter, houses, things that um, allow through their ubiquity to be very specific about architectural intent, site, and effect. So this is a project in Malibu, California, which is a which is a study for two attorneys. And the idea of, of taking an existing house and leveraging the geometry from that to create a, uh, a new addition. So all of the site constraints um, are registered. And then there's a, an idea about light and the type of lighting that they needed, which is a clear story lighting, and the way that it wouldn't be direct so as to interfere with their work, but rather it would um, be diffused through the roof planes uh, on the adjacent roof surfaces to diffuse the light up to the ceiling and down. So the, all of those clear stories are facing northward, which is also toward a hillside. So you're looking up a hillside, reframing that view, and sort of how you deal, um, how you relate that sectional intent with the plan uh, revealed this um, the massing. And there was a, a strange relationship between symmetry and asymmetry that resulted from that. And then the views, the ensuing views that were designed to relate to those geometries. And the uh, daylight is a huge part of the work. So an extensive analysis of the daylight at all different times of day, times of year. And looking as the sun moves across from east to west, seeing how the roof responds, that diffuse light across the roof through lighting models, seeing how that pattern changes. And the roof, the lighting of the roof actually registers the sun's movement, even though you're never seeing the sun per se. different views uh, back out. So much like uh, Olafur Eliasson looks to his work as an optical device, all of these projects are you know, some type of device for viewing. Here's the project in context and physical model. Again, the proportioning and geometric overlays that frame these spatial relationships. Um, sense for the interior, again looking up toward the garden and up the hillside and a, and a play on symmetry and asymmetry between the two halves. Measuring the roof angles. This project is to start construction later this summer so this is um, both the technique for designing and building are, are interlaced. And then if you look back the other way to the south, you can see a big picture window that's actually into the interior of the, of the house to the second level, which is another uh, way to view the space. Uh, when I was 
uh, an MPhil student at the University of Cambridge, I was studying Le Corbusier in Chandigarh, and I was looking at uh, some of his devices that he built in the capital complex to register the movement of the sun and other environmental conditions like the Tower of Shadows. And I became interested in how uh, one might design uh, architecture uh, as, uh, as a device for registering uh, light of different types. So I was looking at different types of shadow, direct light and diffuse light in a, a pavilion. Uh, ways to cut and fold operationally the different surfaces to create uh, the effects I was looking for. And then here is a physical study model. Uh, this is the ceiling geometry. Uh, And then look at the effects of different profiles and the shadows they'd produce. So from the um, showing the overall box profile in one to the kind of um, atypical profile of the, the cuts. This is a project for a, a guest house uh, in Malibu, California. It's a um, <clears throat> it's a pool house that's on a very steep slope, and it's uh, on a on a rather tight budget for what it is. And so, looking at how you take kind of basement and parking garage technology and techniques, and doing um, in you know casting. Uh, slabs and simple sonotube columns uh, uh, and penetrating the, the ground. So using the whole house and the back wall of the house as a retaining wall so that the whole house is actually negotiating the hillside uh, through, through its retaining wall. You can see in plan the main house and um, the way that the, the access to the house is such that you'd walk down a staircase, you'd see the view to the ocean, which is down the canyon, then loop back into a staircase downstairs and then see it again from the pool deck. Um, rather elaborate uh, foundation scheme, uh, but simple. It's Uh, and then the idea of pushing into the hillside and pulling out in various ways to create the desired effect. So you can see the stairway coming down. Different lighting studies into the space. And again, the architectural promenade and the views. Like kind of result of that cutting into the hillside, looking along the pool. Um, so for the same clients as a result of some planning constraints, this project was abandoned or at least postponed indefinitely. And um, the owners went ahead and, and um, bought another house nearby, which is a, a ranch house from the 1960s. And here the challenge was to take a very conventional house and imbue it with a lot of the same qualities of something that was cut into a hillside underground and this infinity pool. Uh, and again, uh, this is the sort of tactics part of the game. There, there was a strategy. The strategy was transposed to somewhere totally different with a totally different set of constraints. And so how do you, how do, you do that? So the upper diagram on the right shows the existing ranch house. And uh, for a really limited um, uh, budget in terms of this, the scope of the overall, how that could be, how that could be uh, cut the existing roof bifurcated, lifted, 
and reoriented to the south so that you have this east-west axis for the for the pool and the deck once again to kind of give the maximum solar exposure to create these outdoor terrace spaces and to provide this panoramic view that this particular site affords which is really remarkable it's uh it's a more than 180 degree view of the of the pacific ocean and as you approach down the driveway taking this ranch house and starting to cut it apart and actually use that as an optical device to frame the view to the horizon uh, i was thinking a lot of about um, uh, Sujimoto and the uh, horizon photographs and then looking at how to impose this new set of axes to you know to overlay them on the site and here's the existing roof uh, cut away and lifted And again, how to create this transformation from the existing ranch house where the roof plane on the right side you're seeing is actually the existing attic roof uh, that's been cut away, reinforced, um, lifted up onto a new roof plane, and you have a Virendil truss running across the front that allows for uh, the open sliding glass doors that the clients wanted. And... Um, all of the, the views in this particular area have been shaped along these various axes, so a new aperture to the west is cut out. And the entire uh, project is about sort of lifting and reinforcing the horizon. Looking at the various ceiling heights that result kind of mapping like a depth sounding of the different ceilings. And again, a sunlight study looking at how you'd get some of that northerly light through the upper clear story windows. Uh, well, at the same time, uh, you'd have a trellis with an operable screen to shade the south. And again, looking at the various viewing positions as you enter the space, as you move out um, toward the lanai space, as you move toward the kitchen, as you look from there and, and how you would sort of calibrate those in relation to the wall positions. And on the pool deck itself, creating a framework uh, with operable screens so as to have the most control over the environment. And, and once again, to continually reinforce the horizon, it's sort of how, how do you play to the greatest strengths of a site? And this is uh, what this site is about. It's about viewing the ocean. Similar to the ocean, perhaps, uh, is a project for a client in Marfa, Texas. And it's for a family from London um, who bought a lot out uh, just outside the city of Marfa in the county and are looking to do a, um, a retreat for their family. And with an existing house uh, built by some architects uh, just to their west, they're thinking about how, uh, how to have privacy and, and, again, how to position the house to get the view to the Davis Mountains to the north. And again, looking at the axes on the site, looking at all of the viewing conditions. So all of the various uh, sites are mapped, their angles are plotted, and the actual size and shape of the house is positioned in relation to that. And the courtyard was studied extensively. How do you do the most for the least? So with the kind of least material and least budget and the maintaining a particular area, how do you get the most courtyard? How do you get that to work with the, the various spaces inside? How do you negotiate the best driveway? <laughs> And 
but I think these are fascinating because it's how you approach and how you how you it's all about viewing and what's the sequence of viewing. So here's a sequence of the final driveway configuration showing showing a car um, approaching in all the different elevations, rotated as you move toward the house, and what that experience is. And um, I found it to be super intimidating to work in the middle of the desert with uh, very little context in the shadow of Donald Judd. Um, so again, going back to site and being able to think about sun and privacy and all the things that would go into shaping the architecture. Um, that's where I went back to. So kind of, again, extensive sun studies. And the entry to the carport. And again, in physical model. In the entry court, there's a rendering. And so it's a series, it's two courtyards that you sort of move from the carport into an entry, and then you move through the house to a, uh, to the main view to the north, to the Davis Mountains. And looking at this as an object in the landscape, the ground is subtly moving away from the house as you approach. And so what I did is uh, I actually paralleled the, so I took the ground, I took a, a, a datum line through the center of the house and then I mirrored the ground plane to, to create uh, a roof plane that would reflect that. So the object's actually growing taller as it grows deeper into the lower ground. Where the inside of the courtyard remains straight, 90 degree parallel sort of to reinforce that the, the optical qualities of looking toward the horizon from the exterior uh, it behaves differently as an object. So you can see that the, you can see the outer sides, outer walls of the house are taller and the inner are, are uh, straight. And again, an overlay of what geometry is, is shaping what down to the relationship between the water elements, uh, the pool on one end on the north to the, the well uphill to the south. And the bedroom and living wings. Kind of public courtyard spaces. View from the road as you approach before you get to the driveway. Entry sequence. And then looking back toward the courtyard. And then you move through toward the the desert so you're just it's a it's a uh, sequence a um, bit of an enfilade but it's room to room it's outdoor room to middle room to exterior room so you get the uh, approach out out to the desert And <clears throat> totally shifting gears, this project is a, is a current project I'm doing right now. It's supposed to start construction um, uh, later this summer, which is a, a new technology laboratory and um, teaching space at a middle school in Los Angeles. And it's a design lab, so it's based, It's all about design. how to teach design thinking. They have maker bots, they have laser cutter, they have all these, these things they want to teach students how to think about design and making. And um, one of the things that was interesting is there's, as a didactic element, using uh, the outdoor space uh, as, a, as a teaching area with a canopy that would move like a... Um, like a sailboat. So looking at 
some sailing technology to make a canopy that, where the students can control it. And again, addressing um, you know, these environmental conditions, but it, allowing the students to actually um, manipulate this thing. Um, so you'd be able to have an outdoor teaching space. And this thinking about architecture and sailing is something that's that's been really important to me, especially recently. Um, uh, one of the great joys I had in working at Gary Partners was um, Frank was generous enough to loan his boat uh, to us, and I was a captain of the sailing team, and we raced every week in the summer, and. Um, and it's something that uh, I've done with my family since I was a baby. Uh, but thinking about how sailboats respond to the environment and how they, you know, forms are designed to do these multiple things and respond to all of these different conditions, uh, both, you know, structurally something lightweight and strong. Um, it's something that's it's, I've been thinking more and more about and. Some of the work I've done with my students at USC um, has been uh, has been looking at uh, looking at that. So I was extremely grateful to USC for helping to sponsor a pavilion for Blue Tape to you know, uh, Dean Ma and Mark Schiller and Gail Borden. Uh, where I used string string uh, with the students to create these. Um, structural skins. So we created a composite using resin and string uh, to actually make these these skin surfaces uh, for a pavilion where we took a wood frame and then actually deformed it and bent it like spars so they were under compression and tension. And it's something that I'm going to explore further with a symposium on sailing and architecture this fall at USC and going to have Greg Lynn there to, uh, uh, we're going to look at his new trimaran that he just designed and um, talk about the relationship between, between sailing and architecture and the use of composites. The final project I'm going to show is, uh, is some ongoing research, which is for a house in Puerto Rico. And this is, uh, I'm calling Casa Dunas. And this is for a client who is a landscape architect who's actually been looking at dune ecology and actually working on some of the post Sandy recovery um, uh, landscape and urban design uh, on Long Island. And this project. For me, <clears throat> was an opportunity to think about site once again, but site, how architecture can respond to site, in this case a very particular uh, type of site, dunes, and where there's movement and flow and uh, storm surge and whatnot, how to make an architecture that's like a, a seashell that can be worn away, that uh, can reflect the traces of the natural environment and can exist and, you know, in some ways uh, perform as a, as, a, as a ruin as needed, reinvent itself. So looking at, at flow patterns and thinking about how uh, a box or something more typical might be deformed, doing some animation studies to look at um, how things change in sequence and movement over time, and some initial sketches of how how this flow and this deformation might uh, not only impact the, the architecture, but the landscape as well. And, and then thinking about how these void spaces between these forms might contribute to, to, to a new idea of uh, landscape or exterior space uh, in buildings. Here's a 3D print model uh, on the beach in Los Angeles, <laughs> covered in foam. 
um, putting this in the in the water and starting to test wave action and movement on this, where some of the forms you can see uh, dig into the sand like an anchor and actually deflect the movement of the water in particular ways, so to actually shape the landscape around them. So as the as the flow of water and sand and wind over time might actually, the building itself could help to shape the landscape in a particular way. So that the architecture would not only be background but foreground and, and a, um, a protagonist in the story of sight. Looking at some of the details from this, these are physical model photographs at the beach. And then looking at these curved uh, concrete wall surfaces, thinking how they might um, resist some of those flows or shape some of those flows in ways different than um, rectilinear walls might, that they would allow the forces to pass through and beyond. Kind of looking at the actual flow of you know, water through this. And then like the seashells, kind of the multiplicity of spaces within and how they relate. Looking at a view of what this might be. Thank you very much.